Well, this is um, me just having a quick run through uh, the third chapter in Arnold. The book has a theme to it. It's really basic. It's really just um, trying to establish in each chapter something that isn't quite what it seems. In this case, in chapter three, it's really talking about how do you interpret how do you interpret things that were going on, things that you read about, things that were reported. How do you interpret it, given that you know the world now, and that several things were not quite the same? Um, and he makes a point very early on that the amount of evidence that we have is not big; it's not large. We've already seen examples in earlier chapters about how sometimes there's more than one piece of evidence, for example, a chronicle uh, concerning some event that took place. And historians have to choose which parts of each of, in that case, which of those chronicles was to be trusted more than the others and to, to pick carefully what they use. One way that the historians go around that, about that, and it's, it's true just as much for the present day as it is for 12, 1200, 1300, 1400, 1500. Actually interpreting what you're looking at requires more than just um, a bit of knowledge about one line of thinking. You need bits of knowledge about multiple lines of thinking. So historical work tends to be very interdisciplinary if it's done right. Accounting historians since the 1990s, the last 30 years, have added theories from uh, philosophy and sociology, from the social sciences effectively, to their work but really only philosophy and sociology. And, they, but they, and in that sense, it's been interdisciplinary, some of it, and that's called new accounting history. And the, the accounting historians who have adopted it are referred to as socio-historic accounting historians. That's only a, a small aspect of interdisciplinarity. It's only a small element of this interdisciplinariness. What he says in the chapter is that the most important discipline um, of all of them for a historian to get involved with or to use the knowledge of is anthropology. Because it, it's, it's all to do with human beings. Um, and it helps to give you an understanding of the process they're going through. And in doing that, it allows you to develop right questions. And that's his point. If you use this, this expertise from other disciplines, you can begin to ask questions that you weren't aware of in the first place. And that really is helpful to a historian who maybe comes from one particular discipline. So you have economic historians, accounting historians, social historians, all with their specialist background. And when they bring in these other thinkings, type of thinking from other disciplines, other people, and work with them, it, it make, enables them to see things differently. And one characteristic of historical work is that it's never finished. We're continually work, finding out, discovering more and more about the past. And it's quite astonishing just how big the changes in our knowledge are from time to time. And as a result, when new knowledge has emerged that is relevant to some historical event or artifact that has previously been looked at, historians will go back and look at it again 
And in a way, that's, that's what's happened between the article by Raymond DeRuver and the article by Richard Goldthwait. 60 years had passed and we'd learned a lot. And among the things that had been learned was how to use the archives a bit more productively. Um, so it was like archival expertise really that was bringing um, meaning where none had previously existed or bringing understanding where previously it was a different level of understanding and wasn't valid in the way that the, 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 the more informed recent scholarship or research in history, history would be. So we revise things, you go back and look at it. And that's why you'll find a paper, an article published in the 1930s. In the 1940s, there'll be another article on the same topic and it'll move slightly what's happened. 1950s will be different again. And 1990s will be different again because more is known and more is understood. And it goes on to talk about whether pre-modern society, which is medieval, that's up to 1500, whether people thought differently from now, but still thought logically. And what did, what they do, what, the things they did, what did they actually mean? How were they interpreted then, as opposed to now? Even things as basic as hand gestures, the meanings might be very different. So when you read about a description of what a ruler did or um, a merchant did, and it's describing what he physically did, the interpretation then might be very different to now. And what was the role of the people at that time? What was, the, what was understood by the role of king? What was understood by the role of banker? What were the responsibilities? What was the ethical um, underpinning of those roles? What purpose did they serve? How did other people perceive them? And there's not much doubt that people perceive them differently from the way we would now. And if, if he gives the example of gift exchange, and he comes back to it later, but gift exchange, um, why did people give gifts? Uh, why were they, what was their purpose? Was it to say thank you? Was it in order to be owed a favour? What was the purpose of that? And for example, in, in 15th century, if you wrote a book and got it printed, you could give copies to other people. If before printing or even after printing, if instead of printing it, it was written out by a scribe, in other words, copied by a scribe, so you had a copy of it. It was quite common for the copy to be very carefully decorated with gold leaf, with very nice little art, uh, pictures, paintings, if you like, on the, in the margins, and then handed to a ruler or just anyone who was important. It opened doors. It wasn't a bribe. It was a sign of respect. And that's not necessarily how that would be seen today. Anyway, so it takes a bit of attention to detail and the use of knowledge from other disciplines like anthropology, sociology, to be able to actually understand of what the meaning of certain actions was when you're going back whatever period of time, and certainly back into the medieval period. If you look at the way that the society was performing, printing began in the, in the 1450s. Before then, all written texts were hand copied. So, for example, in 1420, you couldn't walk down the main street in Florence and, and 
expect to see what we would expect to see in the main street in terms of and notices, um, newspapers. Town criers existed for a reason. They existed to tell the news because there was no other really clear way of doing it. But if you look back, it's a modernized a town crier telling the news, and they were very common in, in Britain right up until much later than the period we're looking at at the moment. And theatrically, they're still around, so you'll still see the town crier coming out and doing something as a, as a, as a civic um, ceremony type thing. If you look back at them and you don't take off your modern glasses, you'll think they're completely bonkers. They're just, they're just doing something that doesn't make any sense, because why can't they just send an email or write? It, I mean, it's, it's extreme. But that's the sort of problem that historians have got when they can't get rid of their modern way of thinking. So you need to go and get all these other disciplines to help you, and interdisciplinary approaches work. Back in the medieval period, when you could speak Latin, read, write, and speak Latin, that gave you power. That was literacy in, in the full meaning of the word. It was a language used by the important people. The kings, uh, for example, would use it. And generally, the, the authority would use it. And it dominated that level of society for quite a period before slowly the spoken language started to be accepted. You saw in England, um, up until 1066, well, it wasn't French they spoke, the government. After 1066 with the Norman Conquest, when it was occupied by people from what is now the north of France, Normandy, the court started to speak French and so on. It was... Whatever the language was that the government was using gives them superiority because it wasn't the same necessarily as what the common people spoke. But the key one for Italy was Latin. If, they, if, you, um, if anyone wants to gain respect when they wrote something, they would put Latin in. They'd use Latin terms. They'd use... Um, Latin, Latin phrases, or just sections of text that were just Latin. Um, if you wanted to make a point in what you were writing, say you wrote um, a book just about society, if you wanted to make any important points, you did it in Latin. You could write in the vernacular, the spoken language of the rest of the material, but you did those things in Latin because it made it stand out from the text. Now, if you look at that, without being aware of how language developed, how Latin was developing, how people were using Latin, it's quite easy to criticize the quality of the Latin that was in the text. But that's us looking back. At that point in time, that might have been the standard expected of it. But we look back with perfection in our mind. Another thing that... Um, he talked about was, uh, to some extent, was the influence of philosophers, the Bourdieu. Um, and he, he was uh, talking about fama, how what people's, um, the way people looked at an individual, depending on both what they did in public and what people gossiped about behind their backs or even in front of them. And it was a combination of those things. In the same way that today we might do that. So when you're reading, and in fact, it's, in, it's quite frequently between politicians, that type of game going on where you've got the actual physical activities and then what people are saying about them. If you go back and look at what has been written about events and people in the past, that will be brought in. So how much of what you're reading about 
someone was based on what that person actually physically did and how much we were based on what other people said about that person. So if you're going to try and assess whether someone did something well or not, you need to be able to distinguish. So you need the ability to see that. So you use the knowledge and expertise of the other disciplines to see what actually fits. What was, what was it that you'd expect was going on at the time? Th those things were there for those are the things you maybe, when you see them being spoken about, you should pay attention to them. And the other things were just sort of noise in the background that were impacting on what people and how people interpreted. Goes on from there to talk about numbers and statistics. Um, how, when you're looking at history, if you can get any data, you can learn a lot from it. And he gives the example of the Florentine Catasto, uh, Catasto of 1427, which is, it was effectively equivalent of a tax return that every household had to complete. And it was, it also was full of census type information. So it did two things. Whereas today we have uh, annual tax returns and we have a census every 10 years. That one was everything at once. And the amount of data that was gathered was very, very large. Anyone taking that data can write historical uh, studies on a wide range of disciplines. And the richest that have come out of it in the period that people have really been focusing on it are those where multidisciplinary approach is taking place where the individual takes the expertise from other disciplines and uses it to help interpret what's been looked at. Because you can't take the data at face value. It's long been said that the accounts that were put into the catasto in 1427 were more than a little fictional. They were in, they were to they're presented as a indication of the wealth of the person. And the merchants took data out of their account books in order to complete that those catasto, the catasto. Not as is, you'll read about if you read some of the literature, they didn't just rip the pages out of the ledger and put them in with their return. They didn't do something like that. They just picked numbers. And in some cases, they picked numbers that were very much lower than what their ledgers were showing. But the tax officials would have spent years investigating every return to check that it's the numbers that were there were consistent with what was in the ledgers. So when you go and look at the data from the catastrophe, you've got to remember, for example, that the financial data is not particularly likely to be accurate. It's more wishful. The person that submitted that data was wishing to have an outcome that was suitable. And one of those would be to minimize tax by uh, understating wealth. Now, we as accountants can deal with that. But the sociologist hasn't got the same understanding of accounting. So there's a tendency, just to, if you read what they say, to assume that the things are what they appear to be. Gives, gives the example of um, specific things, how there was a plague in 1363, which was much less known than the, the plague of 1338, uh, 48, which killed huge numbers of the population in Europe and Italy. And the 1363 one pushed, apparently, pushed those who were in a position where they made wills to change the things that they did or they wrote in their wills in terms of the beneficiaries and who would get what and how much they would get and what they were to use it for, that changed. So it was a, a situation identified by the surviving evidence of the wills that have, that have survived to this point. Comparing those done after that uh, plague of 1363 to those before. Now that research would have come about because someone was uh, Either because someone was investigating the various plagues that happened, and there are an awful lot of them, 
and just examining that and gathering evidence relating to them. I maybe came across uh, some wills that were written a, a, at a certain point in time, having previously seen some of it earlier and realized they were doing different things in them. Or it might be that someone was in, actually a legal historian was examining wills between say 1320 and 1380 and discovered this difference that took, seemed to be introduced just after 1363, looked around for an explanation and found that there'd been a plague. I would say that plague was, is not so well known, so that way it may have been involved getting some assistance from sociologists who might know about it and so on. He gives some examples of how what's up, what appears to be obviously isn't. He gives some economic theory where population goes down, which it does after a plague. Um, land value will go down because there's less demand for land. And that implies that prices will fall. But if population goes down, there's a shortage of people, so wages will go up. And if wages are going up, someone's got to pay for them. So maybe prices don't actually go down. Also, there's more than one way that people can be paid. So if you're looking at the data about wages, for example, which we you know, accounting historians will use that, economic historians will use that, social historians will use that, they need to look at the um, they need to go beyond the, the financials and look at whether people are being were being given extras like food or clothes um, and see what the total of those things were at one point in time, what they were at another point in time. So if you go before the plague, maybe people were being paid only in money. And then after the plague, they're being paid less money which is strange, but let's say they're being paid less money and instead of the money they were being given clothing or food. So there's lots of things that can be going on that the story needs to think about and, and consider that come from other disciplines or the knowledge comes from other disciplines. Another thing is if you look at organizations, if you look at banks, you've got in your own mind what a bank looks like all of you at some point in your life will have been inside a bank. And if you haven't, it would be something to go and do just so you, you know what it looks like inside. But inside a bank, no. No matter which bank you go to, you're going to end up with you sitting in one, you standing normally at one side and someone on the other side sitting down, working on a computer and dealing with you. Or if you go back 30 years, it'd be someone standing behind the desk and you uh, with some sort of partition between you and them because they've got all the money and you talking to them on your feet. In fact, if you go back just a few years, that was more common. It was less use. Uh, it, was, it was more social than it is now. Although now you've got easy chairs in some banks to sit down and the, the actual meeting places, if you're not actually taking money out, uh, can be more like just being in an office. But banks, talk to anyone today, what's a bank look like? They'll tell you. Now you take that picture and try and transport that back to Italy in the 13th and 14th centuries. They're not what the banks look like, not at all. Um, Bankers quite often worked on tables that in the, in the open air. Others had um, an open part, like a, a shop that had a, a big window that you used pulled it open, or a doorway that you sat at with your table and a green cloth. They all, they, they, what they say is that they, they all have green cloths in Italy. And the way they did their business was very different. What they'd have on the table was very different what you'd see in a bank now. But until you've been told that, you assume that a lot of what banks did and what they looked like was like what they are now. And the historian discovers about these things. Um, the county historian discovers about what the banks looked like from 
history and from social history and from economic history because they all have investigated it. You get bits of help from those disciplines and you put them all together and you end up having a much clearer view. And then you could say, well, what about theft from banks? How did they stop that? Where did they put all the, all the, the money they took in every day? Where did they put it that was safe? We didn't have safes like we would have safes. And um, in Venice in the 15th century, for example, um, they had a place that people could put their money. It wasn't a bank. Anyway, so there was that. And then if you look at the guilds that would have existed, and the guilds actually helped international trade. Um, the guilds existed for the benefit of their members, just as trade unions exist today, but the guilds then didn't have the power the trade unions have now because they weren't so uh, tightly structured. I think that's probably the best way to put it. So nowadays, or certainly 20 years ago, if a trade union decided that all its workers should stop working, they did. And so you get the railways would, would stop, the coal mines would stop. Back in the medieval period, the guilds didn't have that power. They, they provided social uh, benefits for their members and they opened doors for the members. Um, they look after the descendants of a, a member in some cases. So very different. So just because it seems like it's the same, it's an organization of the labor force uh, for particular skill or um, profession and the trade union is the same, didn't think the same, didn't have the same objectives or the same aims. So when the topic of guilds comes into whatever, top, whatever subject you're looking at, you can't just take that at face value and say, well, they, they paid, they paid uh, 10 florins a year to be members of a guild which is ridiculously high amount, let's say one floor in a year to be a member of a guild, and just move on. If you ask the question, why, why did they join the guild? Well, you, don't, you wouldn't find that out from the accounting history literature. You'd have to go and read that literature from other disciplines or work with someone from another discipline already knew, because that might be quite central to what you're looking at. If you're looking at how um, they were paid you're looking, you're trying just to understand what their place was in the society because it seems to be impacting what the merchants are doing. You need to understand where they were. So it, it, it goes through all that um, and makes the point that when you're going, if you're going to apply a modern theory to anything in the past, you need to understand its context in the past. So there's a message in there that isn't so quite so obvious as you're reading through it, but he's really getting that. How do you understand the context of what you're looking at? Where well, you are, you need to be interdisciplinary to do that. From that point, it goes into archaeological, uh, archaeology and material culture. He talks about the casket, the Beckett casket on the front of the book, which is made with glass, which couldn't have been from where it was made. So how did the glass get there? That's the point he's making. Just that one thing tells you quite a lot that isn't obvious about society. It tells you that people moved around. Uh, he talks about the uh, assumptions that were made about the, the way castles were designed in England, where, it's been a, where it was assumed in the literature that they were based on Norman design following the defeat of the King of England at 1066 at the Battle of Hastings, and then Norman, William the Conqueror, getting being the King of England. But archaeologists have discovered that that's false. Until that was done, the assumption was just what I described. So historians were quite happy about their theory. They believed it. They carried on, they wrote about it, but when the archaeologists find out what they found out, 
different perspective was given on what they were looking at. They give, it, they give us a very good example of Henri Perrin's view on the impact of the Islamic empire in the seventh century, where Henri Perrin, uh, he wrote in the first third of the 20th century. And he knew about the Islams uh, being very um, powerful. And I, I talked, uh, I've talked about the, the North African traders who basically were all over Southern Europe and a long way up into, almost into Northern Europe in the period. But he, he decided that on the basis of the evidence, they had made it impossible for the rest of Europe to travel long distances to trade from the seventh century. So he said they were cut off. But archeologists discovered evidence of, the, of that it was not what happened. They discovered evidence that demonstrated that trade was not cut off, long distance trade was not cut off. So it was only when the archeologists came into play that Perrin's economic history perspective on that period, the seventh century, changed. It was long after he'd passed and other people had used his work. And you'll find that the people that stood out in the first half of the 20th century in, in economic history are gradually, several of them are being gradually replaced with more recent scholar, scholars who have taken the benefit, had the benefit of new knowledge that has occurred. So the whole chapter is about this thing about new knowledge in context. And when you finally, he went on to text and cultural theory and he said that literature can be read for attitudes, ideas, ways of thinking, etc. So you look at a Chronicle and you're reading how it's been done. You read a, read a work of fiction, look at Dante. What is it that it's telling you about the way people thought? the ideas they had and um, what their attitudes were. And the story that he has at the beginning is very strongly at that point. So he's gone right through the chapter and at the very end, he's actually referring to things that are relevant to his example that he gives at the beginning of the king and the queen. He says a few other things. Our experience of the world is framed And it's impacted uh, or interpreted by language. So our experience of the world is framed as the way we look at it and, it, and the way we interpret it is dependent on language that is used. And the language tells you a lot. So if you're reading something, the language in it the emphasis that's placed, the roles that it indicates, they all help you to understand what you're looking at. And we use language, and he puts in brackets culture. So he's really talking about the culture, but he's using the word language. And you get the culture of, of the period from the literature about the period, for example. So he's saying, we use this to present ideas or how we think it is or should be. How we think it is or should be. And literary texts are formulaic. So not only have you got the ideas, the attitudes and the ways of thinking coming through from the text, you also have signposts within them. And this again is repeating something from earlier chapters in the book the sequencing, the structure of what has been written, because it's formulaic, you know where to look for what you need to find out about. For example, if you're a, a merchant in the 13th century and you want to send a letter, and you're in Siena, you want to send a letter to Champagne, telling your colleague in Champagne at the fair that um, someone called Fred will be arriving very soon and will request 100 um, 
100 florins or something in local currency. You'd put that in a specific place in the letter. You wouldn't have it at the beginning or at the end. It'd be very clear where it goes. And I think it's in chapter two, he actually lays out sections that you would have. And finally, the final point that, that I took from the chapter is that he, in his view, identity is contextual. So what things, what something looks like, what someone appears to be or something appears to be, depends on its surrounding context. So here again, he's banging away at context. So history relies on use of interdisciplinary sources, whether that's what people know or people who have those skills from those disciplines. And it relies for anyone to have the ability to interpret history or to describe it as accurately as possible, you need knowledge of context. So interdisciplinary context. And the overriding message so far in the three chapters, put it together, is that what you see when you look at history is no way guaranteed to be what you think. Because we're not exactly the same as people were then. We've got different values, different beliefs. And what you, the picture you build up, what you're reading or looking at, needs to use the context of the period and this help from other disciplines to be able to separate your understanding, your framing of that, so that you don't infect it with the way you think today and the way our society is today. And you need those things, the context and the interdisciplinary help in order to pull yourself away from today and position yourself then in the past.